let alone sermon. Uh, and we know that as Jesus went about his ministry of teaching and healing people of their diseases and casting out demons, uh, crowds gathered. He caused quite a stir. A lot of people gathered. And as he did his ministry in the highly populated areas around the Sea of Galilee, the Decapolis and all these towns that were around, uh, people flocked to him. Now, one of the kind of slightly unusual, maybe su slightly surprising things is that when Jesus saw these crowds flock to him, often he would leave. He would withdraw. Sometimes he would withdraw by himself to pray. Other times he would withdraw to be with his disciples and to teach them. And that's what we find in uh, the start of Matthew chapter 5. If you've got it open there, that'd be helpful for you. Uh, Jesus sees the crowds and seizes the moment and uh, no he recedes he goes up on a mountain and after he sat down his disciples came to him and as we saw last week he begins his sermon with these words he says blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs now as we looked at last week this is Jesus vision of the good life the, the blessed life the life that God approves of and says yes this is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm calling you to be. It's the best way of life. Now, on a little, I want to push in a little further on, uh, what, on the context of what Jesus is saying here uh, that, that surrounds this sermon. Um, why does Jesus draw away from the crowds? What does he think he's achieving? This is kind of the question I'm asking. What is he achieving by doing this? Why does he move away from these highly populated areas, go inland and preach to a smaller... It doesn't make sense to me. Surely at this point, this is the, like where you want to hit the accelerator, Jesus. Uh, if you start up business, right, this is where you kind of really ramp up your production. Uh, you know, if, uh, if it was in a digital age, right, just as Jesus is about to go viral, he logs out and pulls back. Nothing makes sense about this unless you realise, I think, the context in which Jesus is doing this. We need to remember that Jesus is a travelling teacher. He's not like the priests over in Jerusalem who have this official kind of role. He is a travelling teacher, moving around, preaching in large groups and small, in houses and synagogues. And as he goes about doing this, there is another group of people that his audience, his hearers, might associate him with. Another group of people who were kind of travelling teachers, who would go about calling people to repentance and calling them back to God. Uh, people who weren't the official priests, kind of recognised, but, but faithful Jews, right? Which group do you think that is? It's the Pharisees. Pharisees were not official teachers, right? They just really love God's law. They really wanted people to obey God. So Jesus kind of occupies the same social position, status, not status, but uh, kind of area as the Pharisees. So I wonder, and this is a bit of a hypothesis, okay? Take it or leave it. That's okay, I don't mind. Uh, I wonder if part of what Jesus is doing here in the Sermon on the Mount is distinguishing himself from the Pharisees and saying, this is not who I am. Now, if you've been in church for any time, or even if not, you'll know that Jesus and the Pharisees were not best mates. Uh, they did not have a close relationship. Jesus has very cutting things and the Pharisees are constantly trying to take him down. Uh, and so you might not be surprised to hear that Jesus and the Pharisees are different. Well, of course. In fact, you might even say, well, I know how they're different. The, the Pharisees... Uh, we're about calling people to obey laws and rules uh, and Jesus is calling people to kind of, he's about grace and acceptance. Now it's true that Jesus' vision does call Christians to be different. That's the whole point of being salt and light, right? It, it's different, it changes the situation. Uh, but I want to suggest there's something more going on. And in order to address that question, I think uh, this question is helpful for us. What is the difference between a Pharisee and a follower of Jesus? 
So let's see what uh, he says here as we go through. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Um, the first thing that Jesus says about being a follower of Jesus's is that you're on mission with God. Uh, so you see there, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. And then verse 14, you are the light of the world. These are not passive things, these are active things. And, and just by the way, uh, where Jesus says you, he's not talking to you individually. He's not saying you are to be a grain of salt in the world or you are to be a little candle in a dark place by yourself. He's talking to the church, right? This is a, it's you plural. Use. Use are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Y'all, if we're American. Um, now, what does it mean to be salt? Uh, lots of different uh, inferences you could gather. I kind of pick up three uh, from my reading of the Old Testament. Uh, first thing is that um, I think salt makes things taste better. That's not unsurprising, right? Everything tastes better with salt, as Anthony's already mentioned. It's a rule, right? Everything tastes better with salt. My family will know I'm very liberal with the salt grinder. Love me a bit of salt. And, you know, like even sweet things taste better with salt, right? Salted, are you going to choose the salted caramel ice cream or the, just the caramel ice cream? Like there's no choice there, of course. It's the salted caramel you go for. Uh, we discovered a few years ago, choc chip cookies. What makes choc chip cookies really good? Salt. That, that, that just puts them in a different class, right? Salt makes everything taste better. Um, it just makes it things better. Uh, so in the Bible, uh, the offerings, uh, grain offerings, were to be made at the temple, and uh, you find in Leviticus 2.13, seasoned. They're to have salt on them. Um, maybe God prefers his food seasoned with salt as well. No, joking. God, that offerings were not to feed God, you know. Um, but just salt makes things better. First thing, uh, second thing is salt preserves. Uh, it makes things last. Right, so in the book of Numbers, in chapter 18, Yahweh is recorded there as making a covenant of salt which is this beautifully poetic way of saying a lasting covenant, a preserved covenant. Salt preserves. Third thing is salt purifies. So in Exodus 30, God gives instructions for the burning of incense in the, in the tabernacle and says that along with all these fragrant spices that I've never heard of and don't know what they look like, uh, the one thing I do know that, that goes in there is salt. And it's to be added, it says there, pure and holy. It purifies. That might not be a connotation that we would uh, use, but in the ancient world, they did. Salt purifies. Uh, you can't add anything to salt to make it saltier. And if salt loses its saltiness, then it's, it's worthless. Right? It, it's good for nothing. It can't purify, do what it is meant to do, just chuck it out. That's an interesting question. Have you ever had salt lose its saltiness? Anyone? No. I think this is true. I'm no chemist, but I'm pretty sure salt can't lose its saltiness unless it's mixed in with other stuff that kind of is not salt. It's kind of, yeah. Uh, but if it were, somehow, well, what's it good for, right? You've just got white powder. What, what can you do with that? Nothing. Chuck it on the path like it's, it's good for nothing. It has no use at all. So, Jesus' disciples, the church, is meant to make things better, is meant to preserve, and meant to purify. Second thing Jesus says about his followers is that they are meant to be light. Um, we have the privilege of living in Australia where light is in abundance and everybody wants to live here because we have so much light like we are everyone wants it to be here that or a tropical island right because there's light now we know it's desirable but if you've been here at church for our previous series you might be a little bit 
confused because Jesus says here to his followers, you are the light of the world, but if you remember back in John, he says, I am the light of the world. What is happening here? Jesus says he's the one who brings light into darkness, who reveals ultimate reality. That shows that God is meant to be worshipped. He exposes the darkness of evil deeds and eventually will banish evil completely. Right? So Isaiah 9 prophesies, we read this at Christmas time, it says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. Jesus has come into the world. He is the light, as John says in his first chapter of his gospel. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So if Jesus is the light, how can his disciples be the light? Well, I think how it works is this. As Jesus went back to heaven, to his Father's side, he sends the sanctifying Holy Spirit to make his people light in the world. Light in this dark place. Light in this, this glorious and yet darkened place. Lights in every community, in every tribe, every workplace. The Bible says this whole world is in darkness. And we are to be a light that reveals ultimate reality, just as Jesus did. To point people to the God who made the world. And to invite them to join us in worshipping Him. That's the task that was always uh, the responsibility of God's people. Israel was meant to be a light in the world. And the followers of Jesus, um, I take it, are meant to be uh, lights in the world as well, a light in the world, as Jesus' representatives, sanctified by his spirit, his ambassadors to the world. Okay, salt and light. How does that work? How are we to do that? Jesus answers, perhaps not in the way that we might expect. He says, we are salt and light when we do good works. When we are do-gooders. Uh, verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. When, when we are salt and light, when we, when we make a difference in the world by the good deeds that we do and are seen to do them so that the world responds by directing its love and worship toward God, that is when we are salt and light. When we adorn the gospel, the, the good news about Jesus, when we adorn that with our actions, with our good deeds. Now, uh, I understand that that is a difficult proposition, actually. When you look at the church and you see so often uh, the deeds of the church have been anything but good. Um, not to say that the church has done no good, of course not. But the church has been guilty uh, of uh, disturbing evil. Where you see the brokenness and the hypocrisy uh, of the church, right? You think institutional responses to child sexual abuse. You think of high profile Christian leaders who've been exposed for their double standards, lies, greed, lust. Right? Very difficult to see how this is true. And I think it's also very easy for us, because of those things, to say to the world, no, no, don't look at us. Look at Jesus. In fact, I think I've kind of said that in, in you know, various ways myself. Don't look at Christians, look at Jesus. I mean, who would want anyone expecting us too closely? But Jesus says, no, no, you are the light of the world. And so you are to be seen. Just as salt is to be tasted and, and, and a light is there to be seen and to, to shed light around it, not hidden. So are we not to be hidden away because, well, the world will see it and worship God. 
Now, I'm not convinced that even when we do those good deeds, it will necessarily lead to the world praising and glorifying God, right? Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, expects that people will not respond rightly to our good deeds. So he says in, in his letter, uh, live such good lives among the pagans that uh, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. On the day. But though they accuse you of doing wrong. See, it's, it's true that Christians also do foolish and hurtful and wicked things and are rightly called to account for that within the church and by the broader society. And I think it's also true that some people walk away from the church for a season because they see Christians in the church not worshipping with the zeal that they might expect of his followers, Jesus' followers, not having that passion for good deeds a desire to live holy lives, not really concerned with seeking justice and mercy. But I think it's also true that uh, Christians will do good deeds and even Jesus says they will be hated because they first hated him. Right? That's what he, Jesus said. Or even you look at the Beatitudes themselves, right? Uh, we looked at last week. That you are blessed when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. And, and yet, this is true what Jesus is saying as well. If Christians are salt and light in the world, if our actions adorn the gospel message of Christ, then some will see our good deeds and it will lead them to worship God. Now that, that's profoundly important, isn't it? That gives incredible purpose to our good deeds. Now, if we can be salt and light, then, we, then the world, hopefully, will see such a reflection of Jesus, such a picture of his power and his character displayed before them that... Through his church, they are turned to the message of Jesus. And so I think that's an incredible encouragement to us to be salt and light in the world because God will use that. He will make use of you in bringing others to himself. So this now leads us to kind of the central point of the sermon, I think, this part of, this, of my sermon. And, and that is that followers of Jesus had to be more righteous than the Pharisees. So verse 17, if you look there in your Bible, chapter 5, 17, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Strong words. What's going on here? Um, Firstly, Jesus says here that he hasn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfil it. Now, helpful for us to be clear here what Jesus is talking about when he says the law. Uh, some people, when they hear law, they think list of rules. I think that's what Jesus is talking about, this list of rules. Actually, the law and prophets is kind of referring to the whole Old Testament. Uh, it's not uh, rules to follow so that you can become good moral people and therefore be acceptable to God. That's not what he's talking about. Actually, Law and the Prophets is a way of describing God's gracious story of, of what he is doing in the world. His love story. Uh, this unending pursuit of people to be his very own that we find in the Scriptures. And so when Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the Law and the Prophets, but to fulfil them, what he's saying is, 
I've come to finish the story, to bring it to a, its, its climax, this love story. So we get a hint of this fulfilling from um, Matthew uh, in terms of what he's already written earlier. So if you look at, um, just for reference, uh, Matthew 2, 23, it says there, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, right? That that story. Or in Matthew chapter 3, where Jesus is baptised by John the Baptist, it feels a bit weird, that situation. Why is Jesus being baptised? What does he have to repent of or anything like that? Uh, What does he say there? He says... uh, that this, is, this must happen in order to fulfil all righteousness. Right? This, this, this is finishing the story. And the point here is that the whole great big story of God seeking after a people who don't deserve it, uh, don't deserve his love, is not that Jesus come to just kind of finish that, turn that aside and get rid of that story, but actually to complete that story. To fulfill everything that God had commanded in the Old Testament. Jesus is not a plan B, right? He is the climax of the story. All God's purposes and promises revealed in the prophets and the law find their yes in Jesus. And this, I think, is crucial for us to understand when Jesus goes on to make this incredibly challenging call. So look at verse 20 there. He says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not get into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I wonder if we don't um, read this right. Uh, Because I think if we're reading this rightly, it should give us... It should make us a bit nervous, I think. It should give us a, a shiver of doubt. Make us stop in our tracks and just think really hard, right? See, from one perspective, verse 19, the one before, uh, if you read it a particular way, it's kind of comforting. Um, It says, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do so, to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, if I'm being a little bit honest, I I can read that and go, actually, I'm okay with that. Least in the kingdom of heaven. That sounds like being told you're getting to go to a five-star hotel and you're getting the worst room i'm okay with that like I, you're in the kingdom of heaven that's your least so that's all right you know at least to there i'm not sure that's what jesus is saying i wonder here if least actually means not i think verse 20 explains verse 19 For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. And that's where I think our nervousness should come in because the Pharisees and the scribes were famously righteous. Their zeal for obedience to the law was undisputed. Their generosity to the poor was gold standard. These were well-respected, trustworthy people. These were the guys uh, you would get to babysit your kids uh, you would, you know, give them a set of keys to your house because you can trust that they will do the right thing, they will look after it, right? We should be a little bit nervous here that these guys... And maybe ask the question, am I really saved? Unless your righteousness exceeds. It certainly makes me... When I look at my life, I don't see all that much righteousness... Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I think this brings us to answering this question of what is the difference between the Pharisees and the followers of Jesus? That's why this question matters. What is the difference between the Pharisees and followers of Jesus? See, if you are a follower of Jesus, I think you actually don't have any need to doubt your salvation whether I'm really saved. If your faith is in the Lord Jesus, you should have confidence about your salvation, assurance that you are saved. Jesus says to his friends 
and followers, right? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Not you might be, not if you keep trying, you will be. You are the salt and light of the earth. See, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will often offer two options, two kind of alternatives, two gates, two roads, two foundations on which we might build our house. And I think that sometimes we might imagine that what Jesus is contrasting is uh, a way of living your life that is uh, accepting God and then one that is totally rejecting God. Uh, That is a life of obedience and then a life of immorality. Um, I don't think that's what Jesus is contrasting here. I I wonder that Jesus is actually contrasting one way of seeking after God through the Pharisees' way and one way of seeking after God his way. He's making a difference between himself and the Pharisees. And what is that contrast? Is the contrast between being really morally good and just working really hard or on the other hand just kicking back and relaxing and receiving God's gift? That's not what you find when you read it. Uh, Remember, Jesus said that if you love me, then you will obey my commands. He's not saying you don't have to be zealous. You don't have to care much about sin. Um, Remember, uh, Paul is the great opponent of of the legalism that came from the Pharisees. And he said, you should should flee from sin and and pursue righteousness. They're They're very, very zealous zealous words. Search it out, out, plant it down. Jesus is not not adjusting, adjusting. the source of the problem, I think. The Pharisees, Pharisees, as they looked at themselves and looked at God, they saw themselves as good. They saw themselves as, here's a contrast, spiritually rich. They said to themselves, I am good, look at what I've done, and therefore I am loved. And the more good I am, the higher up the ladder I climb in my own moral goodness, then the closer to God I get. Right? Look at my spiritual bank account. All these deposits that I've made, I am spiritually rich. And so by obeying the law, I I can climb this spiritual ladder, I can grow my spiritual bank account, and get closer and closer to God and deeper and deeper into his love. I'm good, therefore I am loved. Now, what is the problem with that? The problem is, as I climb the spiritual ladder and make greater and greater deposits in the bank, I think I deserve God's love. Because I've earned it. Right? I I deserve it. Uh, and what happens is I'm just getting what I'm due it reduces God to just a kind of fair employer Uh, I'm loved because I'm good and it removes any kind of sense of wonder and awe at God's love for the ones who don't deserve it because according to that system God is just, just dishing out what people deserve There's no love there. There's no wonder. It's like the elder brother in the story that Jesus tells in Luke 15 who's who's worried about his little brother stealing his inheritance, robbing his bank account, right? The second problem with this system of earning God's love that the Pharisees have is that as you climb higher and higher up, as your spiritual bank account grows, you look down on those who are lower on the ladder, those who are poorer in spirit, you think you're better. And you think, man, if they just tried a bit harder, they could be where I am. And you look down on them. But of course, what the Pharisees had forgotten is that, right, back in that grand love story, right, that big story that, Jesus, that God is telling, that uh, before the Israelites earned anything or deserved anything, before the laws were given, right, 
God rescued Israel out of slavery on eagles' wings. Exodus 20. Before the Israelites did anything to deserve being saved, before they had anything in the bank, they'd done nothing to earn his favour, God set his love on them and he rescues them out of their hopeless hole by his mighty arm. That is what it is to be a Pharisee. To be a follower of Jesus, by contrast, is not to say... I am good, therefore I am loved. To be a follower of Jesus is to say, I am not good. I am a wretched, foolish sinner. I am not spiritually rich, I am spiritually bankrupt. I have no claim on God, I don't deserve anything from Him except one thing, judgment. The Christian says, I am not good, but I am loved. To be a Christian is to know that you are the object of God's love story and to know that the price that God paid for you to be involved in that love story was the, the precious blood of his son to secure your salvation, to know this undeserved, incredibly generous gift of God for us, that he took the penalty in our place so that we might have what he deserved while he got what we deserved. Right? It is to know what it is to be loved and so to love in return. See, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not contrasting good people with bad people, people who, who uh, uh, pray and, and give to the poor and are generous and things like that with, with people who don't. Right? throughout the Sermon on the Mount, both groups do those things. But they do them from entirely different motivations. The Pharisees do them in order to earn their way into God's good books. Right? It's an outward observance of laws, self-interested in the end. But Jesus' followers do it because their hearts have been changed by this inward experience of love that they don't deserve. The Pharisees obey in order to build themselves up Right, which leads to pride and arrogance and judgmentalism. The followers of Jesus, well, they know themselves to be wretched sinners forgiven by the work of Jesus on the cross and loved in spite of their sin. And so they obey, they obey with great zeal. Great zeal. They seek after God. They seek to obey Him in all of their life because they have been loved when they did not deserve it. Right? This is true righteousness. This is the righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees. We've been changed by the work of Jesus on the cross. Because we start with not I am good, but I am loved. We are able to say, I am loved and therefore I'll do anything to be good. My life has been picked up out of the mess, out of the hole, out of the, the mud and the mire and set on the solid rock. And so I will live my life for my Lord and my Saviour. Because we know that we are loved in a way that knows no bounds. Our obedience will know no bounds. This is what it is to be salt and light. We will do those good works, regardless of the persecution that comes from doing them, so that our world might see our good deeds and praise God in worship, the God who has mercy on us. Let's pray that we would be who we are called to be, not to earn our way into God's good books because He has, but because He has loved us. Loving Father, when we stop and consider your gift to us in Jesus, the profound cost of it, the bottomless, endless love that you have for us and that you have exercised for us by sending your Son to die on the cross, 
Oh, Lord, we pray that you would change us, that you would grow us in our zeal, in our response, in our love for you in return. That we might be salt and light. That we might be that which preserves, that makes sense of this life, makes it better and and that which purifies. So that the world around might see our good deeds and not praise us but praise you. For you are the one who has placed your love upon us. You are the one who has changed us by your powerful grace. And so we pray that you'd help us to be faithful followers of Jesus, trusting not in our good works, but in the good work of the one who lived and died and rose again. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.